You know, I'm gonna give you a history lesson. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. <laughs> <laughs> start laughing! <laughs> and when I do, start <laughs> Also, y'all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass, too. Funny jokes and unfunny jokes come out of the same birth. You fing guys are unbelievable. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. And today, I am pleased to introduce to you the worst movie sequels of all time. That's right. We're discussing, uh, I, I think we nailed the essence of the worst movie sequels of all time. Everyone will have their votes, uh, but I put it to people on YouTube and Twitter. I said, give me some suggestions. So we'll tackle a bunch. We have a couple on the list that were suggested that I don't know if they should be on the list, but I can understand the reasons. Um, and then there are, of course, people that say, like, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, they talk about movies where the sequels were terrible, but the original was objectively terrible also. So we'll get <laughs> to that as well. But I think it's an interesting discussion in the sense that um, has there ever been a great sequel? Because originally this episode was going to be titled the best and worst uh, comedy movie sequels of all time. I couldn't think of an absolute best. Like people have a fondness for the Ghostbusters movies for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I My vote for the best, and it's weird because they went on to just pure ridiculousness afterwards. But I think the American Pie films, at least the first, you know, two or three. Yeah. They're, they're, they're funny, but also there's a clear reason you're following these kids from high school to college. They get married, you know, the reunion was whatever, uh, now, and then even like the spinoffs, I think those are like purposely absurd. <laughs> like they're yeah. following the entire Stifler family into different variations of their life. Eugene Levy's at everyone for no reason. Like, why would they be running into Jason Biggs father? <laughs> doesn't make any sense <laughs> but but like they're ridiculous so I, like american pie has my vote for maybe the at least american pie 2 i think might be uh the best comedy movie sequel of all time but i can't think of one like the godfather 2 artistically there was a reason to make mm -hmm. i don't know in the history of comedy sequels if there's one where it's clearly like I wanted to hear more or see more with these characters, you know? I think the there's one that didn't happen, like super bad, like the college years. Like that would have made sense, but they never did it. I suppose. Yeah. And like Animal House seems like an obvious let's just, you know, the Animal House some terrible sequel, Animal House Spring Break or Back to School or something, you know? Like uh, their grades were invalid so they had to go back, you know. It seems ripe for an awful sequel, but they never made one. Um so yeah, we'll get into that more as the episode goes on, but first I want to remind you guys to go to blindmike.net because I've been on a streak now. Now I'm just purposely choosing episodes that will not be monetized on YouTube. So there's really only one way to support the show, and that's by becoming a Patreon or YouTube member. And listen, gang, even if you don't really like the show, it's $5 a week. You know, that's a good sales pitch, right? It's $5 you know a month, Mike. I'm that's sorry, $5 a month. What am I saying? Even better. You guys, imagine if it was $5 a week. That's nothing. <laughs> $5 a month must sound really cheap. This is a great sales pitch where it's like, <laughs> you might not like the product. You're not going to miss the money. <laughs> I don't even know. I should just go door to door. It's like, come on, you're going to really cry over $5. I'll be back what? next month. A large cold brew at Dunkin' Donuts. Four eighty. That's exactty right. Yeah. Four eighty. So, uh, you know, become a member on Patreon or YouTube if you would like uh, early access and bonus content. We appreciate that. It helps us keep soldiering on here. Or if you just want to support the show for free, you know, subscribe on all platforms, wherever you get podcasts. Like us, comment, share, tell a friend. Put us in your Instagram stories. Let people know about the program, for goodness sake. If you have a comedy fan in your life that says, you know, I'd like to hear more. I don't know enough about the worst movie sequels of all time. You can say, well, I'm glad I'm glad you said that because I've got the place to point you. And that's blindmike.net. So uh, support the program. We appreciate that. 
All right. So I figured we are going to start with, and again, guys, leave in the comments, light up those comments and tell us which movies we missed. Cause I know a lot of people are going to have their uh, suggestions, but we are starting with uh, what is pretty globally considered the worst movie sequel of all time. And maybe just the worst movie. And the reason we're starting with it is because I wanted to end with my choice for the worst sequel and I have my or sequels and I have my reasons for that um, that make it much worse than this that we're about to play. But pretty unanimously, I, when the the name Caddyshack 2 comes up, people are just revolted by it. They're disgusted. <laughs> and so let's play the trailer and then we will get into this film. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to rumble. What goes around comes around. Welcome back to Caddyshack. Hey, Ty, you're looking well. Hey, nice to see you, Vinny. Uh, Ted, whatever. Bushwood. Country. Look at, hold on, real quick. Look at how much Chevy Chase is already in the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> like, guys, Chevy Chase is in this. I think they might show every second that he's in the movie. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> he's in it for about 40 seconds, and the trailer is somehow 41 seconds of Chevy Chase. <laughs> <laughs> You want to join old Bushwood, huh? Where snobbery is a way of life. We just don't feel your Bushwood material. I want to buy Bushwood Country Club. Well, let me ask you this. Do I own it? But now its members are going to get what they deserve. What do you think? Isn't it great? Uh, it's great, huh? Isn't it? Huh? Good God. The shack is back. Uh, so, evidently, the shack is back is how the studio pitched it to Harold Ramis. And in an interview years later, he basically said he almost grabbed his chest when he heard that. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, God, please don't do this. <laughs> for this, it's a story of high culture. Woo! I was looking for a poly grip. No, no, that loose stuff you put your combs in. No, and subculture. Oh, I got you now, you little furry freak. Sophisticated lady. Can I ask real quick? Yeah. I, I didn't mean to keep interrupting this. Uh, that was Dan Aykroyd we just heard from, yes? Yep. Yes, unfortunately. Do you think, it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's trying at all to sound like Bill Murray in the first one? Hold on. Actually, I didn't even think of that. Let me, let me rewind <laughs> Replay, it. Guys, if you've ever seen Caddyshack, see, and listen, I pick up on little nuances. Maybe it's because my ears are, but I, I pay more attention to the audio portion yeah. of things. It's very, you can barely tell, but see if he's trying to do a Bill Murray impression here. Yeah, I didn't, I, I'll pay close attention this time because I didn't hear it. Let me Good, see. Good, thank you. And, no. and subculture. Oh, I got you now, you little furry <laughs> freak. I don't hear it. Sophisticated <laughs> ladies. Ooh, you did that on purpose. Well, I will be a caddy all my life. I'm going to car wash school in the fall. And perfect gentlemen. Have you ever seen a Christmas $50 bill? I tell you what, if I pull the arrow out, will you please suck out the poison for me? Caddyshack 2. Is there any money in it for me? Remember, Chevy Chase was in this. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big star. It's very funny that they end with, is there any money in it for me? Which has to be an homage to the fact that Chevy Chase is just doing this for the money, right? Has to be. Even they can't be. The people that wanted to put this together even had to say, like, yeah, guys, this is a money grab. They were like, yeah, we made it. It stinks, but this is why. <laughs> well, what's interesting about that trailer is, so Jackie Mason is the, essentially the star of the movie. And he's in the trailer for, what, three seconds? You yeah. barely see him. <laughs> it's crazy. You see, they're trying to bank on uh, Chris or the vacation movies because Cousin Eddie was in it a lot. It's, it's like if the, the Iron Man trailer was just all John Favreau. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like what is this? <laughs> Maybe we want to see it more, actually. Well, I guess. But uh, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, uh, oh, and Craig, I should have asked uh, before the show, but do you have all my, my facts, my box office facts ready? Pull those back up. Those are uh, up in the email. But um, so Caddyshack 2, obviously a huge success. Um, although when Harold Ramis talked about it, he was like, it's not as big as a success as some of the other movies financially. So I'm surprised they were so, you know, eager to make a sequel. Like um, it was a disappointment compared to Animal House. So, uh, you know, eight years go by. Warner Brothers is looking for a big box office summer hit. 
and they say, let's just bring back Caddyshack, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe, maybe by that time, again, you, uh, you older folk, let me know in the comments. Maybe by that time, it was a thing where popularity grew as far as like everyone was quoting that movie. So uh, not that it was a cult classic. Obviously, it was a very popular movie, but it made, um, I think, $60 million at the box office. Yep. So not, not, a, not a wild smash hit, right? No, it, it, but the, um, it its budget was only four point eight million. So if you look at yes. that one, yeah. So their budget cool. was their budget was four point eight million. Now for the sequel, mm-hmm. uh, Rodney Dangerfield asked for seven million and a guaranteed five. So he was like, "Pay me more than the entirety of the last movie." Yeah, <laughs> and I'll do this thing. And uh, Rodney agreed to it. And uh, he was under contract for a while. And then as things devolved, as the studio got their their fingers in this pie, Rodney started saying, I'm out of here. <laughs> he, he bounced. Um, Sam Kinison was supposed to play the Ran- Randy Quaid role. He bounced. And when Rodney left, Harold Ramis was like, I, ju- I can't. I can't do this. And uh, with um, uh, there was an interview that Harold Ramis did where uh, he talked about it years later and they they said to him we're gonna get jackie mason to replace rodney <laughs> and harold ramus i believe replied oh please don't <laughs> <laughs> um I, I don't know if you said this yet but did you say how the uh uh caddyshack 2 did in the box office oh yeah so um domestically i think one made 37 million and 60 worldwide or something like that. Uh, Caddyshack 2 lost $9 million. <laughs> <laughs> they, Double oh, the budget said, of the first they, one. <laughs> they said, let's pump 20 million into this thing, <laughs> <laughs> which I assume a lot of that went to uh, Chevy Chase and just paying Rodney Dangerfield to not work. <laughs> um, and and uh, they, they lost money. So this was actually a complete flop on every level where that that's what sets it apart I think from a lot of the other movies we're going to talk about today where like at least some of these made money <laughs> Caddyshack 2 was disastrous all the way around um even the people that were in it at the beginning uh didn't want to be involved Chevy Chase didn't want to be involved at first and then just did it for the money I guess he was a real dick on set no surprise we've talked about Chevy in the past um, and he would kind of go back and forth between uh, basically saying, like, when the director would ask him things, be like, what, do you have no handle on this? And then when they wouldn't ask him things, throw a, a temper tantrum because he, well, his input wasn't included. <laughs> so just the classic Chevy Chase being an asshole on set. Everything about this was uh, the, the process just seemed horrendous. And Jackie Mason just doesn't fit. Now, the reason... I don't think it's the worst sequel of all time. The reason the reason it's not in uh, the running for me is because everyone distanced themselves from it. Even Chevy Chase, when you watch the movie, you're like, he didn't want to be here, you know? Right. <laughs> so it's not the same four or five guys. Uh, you know, Ted Knight died to get out of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, they walk out of the, in the trailer. You walk out of the clubhouse, and there was a fucking circus on the golf, like a literal circus on the golf course. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's a terrible movie. But really, all they did is put the Caddyshack name on it. It's not like Rodney and Bill Murray and Ted Knight came back and just made a complete dud. You know, well, if you listen to the trailer and don't watch it, you might think Bill Murray's in it. That's exactly right. Yeah. Why <laughs> did Dan Aykroyd do this? I don't know. Because he was, he was, he was, I mean, he was not at a point where he needed it at this time, I don't think. Ghostbusters was killing it, you know? Yeah, and he no, he wrote that, was in it, like, he made money. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know why Dan Aykroyd uh, attached his name to this thing. But um, Harold Ramis also was completely going to walk away from the project, but he does have, um, like, if you look on IMDb, it is written by Harold Ramis, essentially so... Um, publicity for the movie wouldn't be so horrendous. He was actually like doing them a favor by leaving his name on mm-hmm. because that's just one more thing where it's like, even he walked away from this uh, shithole, you know? But now people are like, he wrote that. <laughs> I know, but he was, he was uh, trying to be a nice guy, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, oh, that's the other thing is um, I when I thought of this episode originally, what I had in mind was like us playing clips of a lot of people just trashing the sequels they were in. But mm -hmm. you forget what phonies people are that like a lot of the interviews are like, man, I was really excited to do this project. It's just great to be back with the guys filming again. You know, there's only one of these that I think that was true. It just didn't work out. Which we'll get uh, to. All right, we'll get to that. Um, so that's Caddyshack in the book. So it'll probably have most of your vote. Um, but what's next? Uh, we have Zoolander 2. And, uh... For me, this is this has a, a pretty solid standing in one of the worst because I loved Zoolander 1. I romanticized it. And this is this was at a time where it kind of tricked me into thinking like I I I guess I fooled myself into thinking Ben Stiller doesn't need to do this for the money. He could just make a movie that makes a hundred million dollars. It doesn't. He could just make another, you know, Tropic Thunder or something. He doesn't need to do another horrible Zoolander. So they're doing it because they want to do it. Like I really tricked myself into uh, thinking that. So we have a clip of Ben Stiller talking about his reasons for making the sequel. You know, you don't want to let down the fans of the first movie. That's the biggest thing. And so it was really just trying to make a movie that would live up to the first one in, in the expectation of the people who, who really love the first one. So that what that is, I, I can't really tell you because I then you start to think about, well, what what is it that people love about the movie? And I, I don't know. I, I you know, I, they obviously like it as a whole and they have you know, probably favorite things. And for me, I, I, there were, there were parts of the movie that I felt were essential, uh, besides, you know, the Derek and Hansel and their relationship. Um, I always felt that, uh, Mugatu was a really important part of the movie. And so, uh, I, you know, just tried to think of things that, that we would laugh at. And those of us who were making the movie, because it's really hard to project yourself into the the minds of people who, you know, for whatever reason, love the movie. I, I just, it's everybody has specific things that they like about it. So that to me, and maybe you have to read between the lines a little bit because he's not coming right out and saying it. But to me, what that says is I had to come up with a reason to write this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Zoolander 2 would make a lot of money. So I had to think and think and say, how can we sucker these people into, you know, sitting down in the theater for an hour and a half? Um, and that to me is ultimately the problem with all sequels where, like I said, with the Godfather two, it's, Hey, let's build on this story. Let's explain how, uh, Vito got to America and the rise of Michael and kind of the comparison between the two. That's interesting. Even if it makes no money, it's an interesting story. And of course it did make money, but with something gets better than the original. Absolutely. But with comedy, and that I understand Godfather 2 is an example that may prove the rule. But with comedy, there's so much less because if you look at Zoolander, it is purposely probably the most shallow character ever written. Right. Like it's just, hey, this is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is a model who doesn't have a brain. That's the premise of the whole character. Mm -hmm. And so you watch that character grow over the course of an hour and a half or whatever the runtime is. But then what the, these sequels do is completely wipe that away. So like the, the premise of Zoolander 2 is the Derek Zoolander Center for Kids Who Can't Read Good crumbles to the ground and kills everyone inside or something <laughs> but so so derek goes in like to the woods in isolation all of that is built to put us exactly where we were at the start of one where he's depressed uh because his friends died in a gasoline fight <laughs> so so you have to do all this work to take away everything that was built up you know what it reminds me of it's something craig and i have uh, bonded over in the past what it really is, is the um, the finale of How I Met Your Mother, if anyone was a How I Met Your Mother fan. Oh, God. The, the reason people were so furious at that is like, you tricked us into loving these characters for nine seasons or whatever it was. And then in the finale, you were like, yeah, none of that happened. It's just uh, Ted and Robin get together and Barney's still a pervert. That's and your, and your mom died of cancer and the person you thought I was the whole time is it. Bye. Yeah, you could have just watched the the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> and you would have gotten it. Yeah. That's kind of what movie sequels are, where it's like, now nah, we're just doing the first one again. 
Now, the way I think maybe to do a comedy sequel is the way a lot of other movies have done sequels before is like, you don't hear The Force Awakens get bashed because it was essentially a remake of uh, the first Star Wars movie. But it's got a new cast and it's it's introducing you to new characters. So people are like, yeah, you know what? It was nostalgic. But if you just had old Harrison Ford <laughs> right. and old, uh, 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 what's her name? Uh, Carrie Fisher and old uh, Mark Hamill and all these people and you were just doing the same movie again, you'd be like, why are we sitting through this? I don't want to see these characters doing the same shit, but now they have gray hair and they can't yeah. do all the same moves they used to. Well, it's also just easier for movies that aren't comedies, I think, because, you know. Yes. Yeah, gotta, particularly like gonna, action movies. Yeah. yeah, you're going to lean heavily on old jokes, I feel, well, as we see. Yeah, and so that's that's what bothers me about that Ben Stiller clip is these writers that do comedy sequels sit down and say, all right, what was a great joke from the first one? How do we make people laugh at that joke again? You know, right, right. rather than, hey, I have an hour and a half worth of entirely new jokes that only work with these characters. Unfortunately, that's very rarely, if ever, the case with comedy sequels. And um, speaking of, you know, the characters getting older and everything. This, to me, it's a very short clip, Ugh. but it encapsulates why Zoolander 2 is so depressing to me. Conspirator, modeling agent Maury Ballstein turns state's witness. I'll give you anything you want in that Bacopta speech. It's just, no, Jerry. <laughs> why did they make you do this? Ugh. It was towards the end of Jerry Stiller's life. He wasn't acting anymore. But it's like, just, we have to shoehorn every character that people loved in the first one. We have to get them in here at all costs. Now, maybe that's like for Ben Stiller. Maybe that's like a nice thing. Hey, get my dad in this. That's important to me. Yeah. But like as a kid who grew up loving Frank Costanza and Arthur Spooner, I look at that and I'm like, why did you make this old man do that? <laughs> Some people say it's the same person. <laughs> it sounds like Chris Farley at uh, remember that SNL clip we played? Where it's like, uh, why are you trotting him out here? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Making him do this. And he just got winded from laughing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that that's that's ultimately what's sad to me is like every they couldn't just be like, yeah, Jerry Stiller's not going to be in this one. It's like, no, no, we have to see all the same faces. And the only reason Jerry Stiller is in that is so we can all go, hey, Jerry Stiller. You know, it doesn't advance the plot. There's nothing to it. It's just a moment where you can go. Ah, I remember that. It's it it's. Was um. It seems like they were trying to do something like um, Ben Stiller's character in uh, Cable Guy. How so? It was just like a little thing, like in the background, almost. You know, it didn't really. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, it's what it is to me is like even good movies like Oppenheimer do this, where they appeal to, and I guess that's what comedy sequels are—is kind of appealing to idiots like me. But um, the one thing that bugged me about Oppenheimer is when they were like. Uh, uh, yeah, who 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 abstained? Ah, some young hotshot senator out of Boston, Kennedy, <laughs> John F. Kennedy, <laughs> and that's for us. Uh, like, they, they, there's no way they said it like that, but that's for us to be like, I know him. I know. I know who that is. Oh my God, does he have a tragic end or what? <laughs> so uh, yeah, so Zoolander. Uh, I watched a clip where uh, George Clooney was talking about this. And um, he he was basically like, hey, listen, people bash sequels, but like sequels make money and that helps smaller movies like these smaller movies that that you like. The studios are able to make those movies because of the money they make on sequels. Now, my argument against that would be if you stopped diluting the market with all these movies that are like, remember this? <laughs> <laughs> then people might feel forced to be like, oh, let's watch a fucking art house movie or something, you know? Well, uh, Zoolander 2 came out and I was like, I don't have to go see it. Yeah, I, it got my hopes up. I remember for some reason, I remember thinking like, oh, this one they wanted to make. And then about five seconds in, I was like, I was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when Justin Bieber did Blue Steel, I was like, okay, I, I fucked up. <laughs> I can go home now. <laughs> But uh, next we have 
uh, a popular one. Oh, sorry. That, the reason I brought up, the, I introduced the money thing is that uh, Zoolander 2 only made um, $6 million. It had a budget of $50 million and it made $56 million. So, uh, At least it was not, green. Yeah, they were in the green, but not not a crazy moneymaker. I think a lot of people like Craig were like, I could skip this one, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, what were you saying? Uh, I was just going to uh, go to the next one here, which uh, was a very popular movie. And that was uh, Anchorman 2. So I got to say, I know we we looked at uh, the downfall of Will Ferrell a few weeks ago, and Anchorman 2 came in a lot. That was, the, you know, a lot, we got a lot of feedback saying, talk about Anchorman 2. I don't think this is one of the worst sequels ever. I didn't hate it. I actually no, liked it. <laughs> there, there are a few things I laughed at. Um, it had a lot of the absurdity of Anchorman, like when he's singing to the shark. Like, that made me laugh. It was stupid and silly, but it made me laugh. Um, and I think as this is the start of Adam McKay kind of being like there, you know, there's commentary in his movies mm -hmm. because I actually think there's an interesting, uh, it's a little shallow perhaps, but there's an interesting message about cable news and like the 24 hour news networks and how everything has to become news in order to sustain this business model. And they have to grab your attention. There was like actually kind of a good storyline with that yeah the car chases <laughs> yeah the problem is again you can make a movie and you can even have you know will ferrell and paul rudd and these people in it you can make a movie about that but ron burgundy is uh, much like zoolander purposely such a shallow character where like in the first one you don't think of it as like a, a good story you just think of it as a funny silly movie but it is like it's a workplace comedy where at the time, you know, where the newsrooms were a boys club. These guys had to get used to working with a woman and then it becomes a love story and all. Like there is a story within Anchorman, within Anchorman that is um, relatable. And that's what a lot of these sequels lose sight of is like now it's they have to get a divorce and get back together. And there's all these weird things that have, have to happen that take away from the plot and you have to shoehorn in like hey remember how there was a fight scene between all the news networks mm -hmm. well now it has to be even bigger and we have instead of like people in that world where each each uh, news it's vince vaughn and will ferrell and ben stiller and uh luke wilson and whoever else was in it now it's mate now it's will smith and like massive <laughs> massive names and that's another problem I had with like Zoolander also, where it's like, the, you know, the first one, maybe you see Kevin Bacon in it, and you're like, hey, Kevin Bacon. Whereas in the second one, it's nothing but stars. It's kind of like Entourage in the later years. Yep. Where like early on, it was kind of cool. Hey, Larry David's hanging out in Ari Gold's office. Whereas at the end, it's like, why would Adrian Peterson be here? <laughs> I don't get I, it. Why would Ronda Rousey date Turtle? Yeah, what, what what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> uh so so we have what adam mckay talking about um anchorman yeah about the uh the uh footage oh yeah so this to me is why again um this type of thinking doesn't work for a sequel because you're not approaching it as a movie you're approaching it as like a reunion of some kind a lot of uh, Anchorman 2 was improvised, a lot of it. And you've said uh, in previous interviews that you have actually got enough alternate material that you could make an alternate cut of the film. Yeah. Is that something that's going to see the light of day? It definitely will. We're editing it right now, and we have a version of the movie where every single joke in the movie is replaced with a new joke. So the only stuff that's the same is the physical movie. So you'll still see the Winnebago crash, you'll still see the shark. But anytime someone speaks a joke, it'll be a new joke in this version. Did that so come out? Me, what's that? Did that end up coming out? I don't know. Maybe in DVDs or something. But to me, what that says is uh, we didn't really have a script. <laughs> right. We could make this whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it could be this movie or it could be an entirely different movie. As long as you have Ron Burgundy, Paul Rudd, Steve Carell, and David Koechner and Christina Applegate on screen. You know, it doesn't right. matter what horse shit we throw in there. You just want to see these people and go, I remember that. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, that's 
ultimately the thing that annoys me now anchorman 2 did pretty well in the box office much better than the first one it d- almost um, doubled it yeah they they spent a lot more money to be fair uh i think they spent like eight or 90 million dollars on the, on the movie and mm-hmm. again i'm sure a lot of that is get, that getting uh, the stars that they have but also like adam mckay talked about in that same interview he's like um there was a lot of high high budget like um stuff they were doing with like car chases and uh the shark the animatronic shark that they had cost mm-hmm. a lot of money and stuff like that and it's like you didn't need to do that you're doing that so we all go wow they put a lot of money but again that's not what anchorman was if you wrote anchorman and said we could just make this you know six different movies because we don't really have a plot then the movie never would have gotten made right. that's where people get lost in the sequels <clears throat> now what i did hear one thing i heard um uh interesting that i think it was matt damon talking about this a little while back and we've mentioned it on other episodes but um the reason comedies like this aren't made as much anymore is because of dvd so like when you look at anchorman um that had like really new life after it came out in theaters because of dvd sales and everything and i remember kids um you know years later like when i was in high school quoting anchorman verbatim because you would just watch it over and over again um and now that doesn't exist so i wonder if either um streaming services are going to well we'll get to streaming services in a minute but i do wonder how that's all going to play out as far as like kind of rebuilding a formula that makes comedies as lucrative as they were when uh, dvds were in play next we have one of the most absurd uh plot lines in any movie and that is weekend at bernie's 2 so this was suggested a lot and i threw it on the list purely to say this we got a lot of suggestions like people um uh, other ones that people said were really bad were like Revenge of the Nerds and the Porky's films and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, those are probably better suggestions than Weekend of Bernie's because I look at Weekend of Bernie's and I'm like, the first one never should have gotten made. <laughs> right. As far as plot line, you know, a lot of people uh, like really enjoyed that movie. But no one says, ah, good. They pretend the guy is still alive. That's a very realistic plot. <laughs> so when people look at the second one and say this is ridiculous i say it's all ridiculous <laughs> you know whole thing yeah so that so we're gonna play uh the trailer but again i'll remind you how much how much different is this than the first one really are you sure yep that's him America's favorite stiff is back. That's Barney Lomax. I recognize that smirk anywhere. But this corpse has a job to do. I found this in Barney's wallet. It's a key to a safety deposit box in St. Thomas. That's the two million bucks that Lomax stole. It's noted as a personal entry. What does it mean? The only one who can get in is Bernie Lomax, personally. And, well, he's kind of dead right now. We go back to the morgue. We get the body. We go to St. Thomas. We take Bernie to the bank. So they're packing him up. I think I'm going to sit down. Thanks. And heading for the islands. Whoa! Gentlemen! Thank you! But they're about to discover... Raise this man from the dead. He will lead you to where he has hidden the money. That Bernie Lomax is more popular than ever. The two guys, they're taking Bernie. Hey, 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 you are in the power of the movie. You were supposed to be your guarding Bernie. Why would I have to guard a dead man stuck in a two-foot refrigerator? You've got style. Why is he now? He's so cute. He's got charm. How did you happen to meet old Bert? In the conga line. He's just got no soul. I just saw a dead man walking on the bottom of the ocean. Uh-oh. But that never stopped Bernie. No. Oh, Paris Island? Who is that? He's our boss. He's dead. Don't worry about it. Uh, from being the life oh, of the party. Ridiculous. Leona, he's not afraid of you. <laughs> You're the bravest guy I've ever met. Weekend at Bernie's too. No like one does boss. dead like Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. I just love I just love the 80s trailers, you know, or 90s, any of that. Um, but what's interesting to me about that one and that that got suggested a ton but like i look at it and say the first one they probably walked into a couple studios pitched the idea 
and at least someone at the table said, well, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to me, it's not that crazy. Now it is weird in Hollywood where it's like, you just see that that makes money and you're like, well, let's make a second one. And someone inevitably would have to ask the man, the body's going to be rotting at this point. <laughs> <laughs> how would we how would we possibly drag another movie out of this well, i don't know if you saw him, mike but when they got to saint thomas they opened the briefcase he was stuffed in and they're like wow he stinks so they sprayed lysol on him and solved the whole thing good good i'm glad they came up with a solution at least <laughs> <laughs> they acknowledged it Sprayed lysol but to me because of the absurdity of the first one i don't really count that like even if you love weekend at bernie's that's great it's a, it's a silly funny movie but I don't look at it and say they destroyed, you know, the regal comedy of Weekend at Bernie's one. <laughs> I think that's more what we're looking at here is like movie and we're building, we're, we're, we're building to the best of the best, I think. But I, I was more looking for movies that destroyed the reputation of the first one. And that's why I don't count Caddyshack as the worst sequel of all time, because it didn't do anything to the first one. People still love that movie. And Caddyshack 2 is almost forgotten about until you have a discussion like this, you know. Right. Uh, and next we have a, a bit of a different pace. Uh, yeah. So this is a Home Alone 3, right? Yeah. I didn't count this one at first. Because first of all, it's more, I, I think of it more of as a kid's movie than a comedy. I mean, it is certainly a comedy. But I think of it as a kid's movie, um, which is why, like, I don't really mind that the second one is more or less a replica of the first. But what I found interesting, what, someone suggested it, and I was like, yeah, I don't know if that fits what we're doing, until I remembered this clip from Siskel and Ebert. So I really just wanted an excuse to play that. Uh, and these guys notoriously hated each other. <laughs> so I just like, uh, I believe, Ebert's review of Home Alone 3. This is going to astound you, but I'm giving the movie thumbs up. It does astound me. Are you okay? Uh, better than you were the day that you liked Starship Troopers. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Uh, I'll tell that, you why that was I like the movie. This movie empowers little kids. This is the one where they finally got it right. I liked it better than the other two. Than the makes, original Home Alone? It makes it, little kids love the idea that they can somehow affect the outcome, that they can have uh, uh, power over growing ups. That's They the can defend one. themselves and be smart and think about things. He hammers and in this in the movie, it's one. not as violent as the second one. The kid is charming. He really is a good little actor. <laughs> and the plot is smarter than we the other. I completely movies. disagree. I thought the kid was generic mop top. And I thought that the whole oh, come on, other... that kid? Yes. Come on. Yeah, there are only two kids. He's very Culkin, good. Culkin's better. And the other thing is, it's the same plot as the first one, only more bumps to the head. The second, they're all the same plot. But what you just said. <laughs> the first one, he literally described the first one. I just love how much these two guys hated each other, that they're pissed arguing about Home Alone 3 versus Home Alone 1 and 2. <laughs> we, sh we should actually do a bonus episode at some point on Siskel and Ebert because they had a couple uh, legendary just sniping back and forth. There's one oh. that I don't think ever made air that's on YouTube. It's great. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll do that uh, soon as a bonus episode. But... Um, that to me, it's an interesting commentary on just human beings. Cause like I've started to like just going to the movies. Like I saw uh, Madam Web a few weeks ago and it stunk, but it was a fun movie experience. You know, you get your popcorn, you sit down for a couple hours, you laugh at how bad the movie is. It's a nice date night out, whatever. To me, I don't understand why a movie like Home Alone 3 does any better than, you know, Madam Web or some other dog shit dumb movie, like whatever dumb action movie that's easy to turn your mind off. I, it speaks to a weird part of uh, humanity where we're like, oh, it's got the same title as the other ones I like. That I'll sit down for. <laughs> <laughs> but this other movie I won't spend two hours at, you know? Like that is a weird thing where if you just slap the title on, make the plot over with a different kid you're like oh this is going to be a good movie now for some reason <laughs> this is going to be a gas <laughs> yeah uh next uh we have another one that was suggested a lot that i saw was uh borat 2 yeah so to me this is nowhere near one of the worst i don't think i don't either but uh there's an inch that I wanted to include it because I think it brings up an interesting discussion. First, this is the first one on our list that clearly was not a money grab. 
that's the interesting part to me is it was done for uh amazon prime if i remember right um so you know it didn't i mean i guess in theory if people subscribed to uh, amazon prime to watch this it made the company money but it was not like just a money grab let's get people to go to the theater just by putting borat on the marquee um so that's interesting to me and it seems like the most clear reason of any of the movies we're going to talk about today borat is clearly a like kind of like the jackass films where it's like you can easily expand on this now right. it came at a point oh where God, was, that would be a perfect example of two three four whatever being perfect would be jackass oh i meant to say that actually and it just slipped out uh by accident I jackass mean, the jackass sequels are probably the best because there's a clear reason to make them you know it makes you laugh when people get hurt yeah, there was no, it's not stepping on the first one at all. There's no plot to follow. You can easily just have 12 hours of them, you know, slapping each other in the dick. And it's always funny, you know? Exactly. So yeah, the Jackass sequels are probably the best. Good call. Um, but yeah, Borat, in that vein, it's like, if he's able to pull it off, kind of like, you know, Impractical Jokers, if they can find people that don't recognize them, can just keep going forever, I guess. What's hard about Borat is... Everyone on the planet has said my wife at some point and very mm -hmm. nice and all that horse shit. It got to be such a popular character. I think they had a good plot device in bringing in a girl to play his daughter so that Borat doesn't have to be in every scene. I think that makes sense. Here's where I believe they fucked up. Because the people who love Borat too and say it was great, and there was a lot of them at the time, if you remember, people were raving about this. Some people were raving about the sequel. And the people that were raving, I think it's because they thought of it as a takedown of the Trump administration. Right. <laughs> and the people that hated it, the people that said it was dog shit, I believe hated the fact that it was a, a takedown of the Trump administration, which is weird. What it really was was like a sequel that probably didn't need to be made that did have some funny lines in it. Like I remember, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen, because he's Jewish, and playing a character from the Middle East is able to get away with a lot of jokes that people in other scenarios couldn't get away with, you know? Oh, like throwing friggin' money at like cockroaches or whatever it was. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of got the cartoon effect where like South Park and Family Guy can get away with whatever they want because it's animated. Right. right. There's a little bit of that because Borat is such an out such an outrageous character and Ali G and any of those guys. Yeah. You can kind you can just get away with more then um you know pick your comedian just saying it as themselves <laughs> right <laughs> um so oh so this to me is what made it so polarizing and it didn't come down to whether or not a lot of the scenes in the movie were funny it was more sasha baron cohen's angle so this is the, the most popular scene in the movie with uh rudy giuliani i'm so sorry that's no, horrible sit sit, sit 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 okay i'm so sorry for that really apologize Apology accepted. No problem. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you again for giving me this time. Shall we have a drink in the bedroom? <sighs> what happened? There you go, my dear. Okay. Thank you. You can give me your phone number and your address. Shall we sleep here? Jackie. Okay. Put down your from. She's 15. She's too old for you. you what, what, she, why are you no, she's she? my daughter. Please take me instead. Take my anus. Don't don't no, take, no take my anus. Do not have her. I'm better than him. No, I better. My back pussy better time. No, please. My throat. <laughs> please, I will let you enjoy <laughs> my heart <laughs> in your mouth. No, I better. I, 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 was, I would love to. I was in you. prison many years, so I have techniques with my mouth. Well, what's going on here? Who is this guy? I forbid this union. Rudy, Trump will be disappointed. You are leaving hotel without golden shower. Even that last line to me is kind of like, oh, you're tr so Borat's like a liberal? Like what? Where did that come from? <laughs> you know? Yeah, at least but, Sasha Baron Cohen is. <laughs> well, right. That's the, that's the problem. So to me, that scene is the perfect example of why some people hated Borat too, and I totally get it, because listen to the music they're playing. 
Yeah, it's like, so different than ever. Yeah, it's so different than everything else they did. Where it's almost like they're making a documentary about a real pedophile. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> you know, whereas the scene is actually, f I think, way funnier. If it's Rudy Giuliani confused, like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> like, if right. they played it the way it happened, where Ju Rudy Giuliani was like uncomfortable that she kept rubbing his leg and shit. I think that's way funnier, and it also plays into the theme of what Borat One was. Um, now, granted, there's probably a lot of that in the editing of the movie. Like in the first one, um, remember those guys that pick him up in the RV or whatever it is and mm -hmm. say a bunch of like racist shit. <laughs> yes. So I, I think it ended up getting like in trouble, like kicked out of school or something afterwards. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe so. But that's framed as in the, in the movie. Borat's one of the guys and trying to relate to them, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that's yeah. what makes it funny is it's you're looking at these guys as the idiots where this is like, guys, look at what a villain Rudy Giuliani is. Isn't that they're evil in the Trump White House? He's a and, and then I was watching Borat where they wrestled naked <laughs> through right. a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's where that's where it got weird to me. And it seems like maybe something that was more appropriate for Sasha Baron Cohen's Showtime show that was more focused on politics. Mm -hmm. But I got to say, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen can do whatever he want, whatever he wants, because while well, he gets some shit for that, but also I think he's in trouble right now with Rebel Wilson. I forgot about that. Sasha Baron Cohen? Yeah, I think there's some some something in the news that Rebel Wilson accused him of something on set. But Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Huh. But I, I don't know enough about it to comment on, on it right now. We'll have to look into it. I didn't even um, hear about that. But yeah, like, uh, I, I lost my train of thought, actually. Oh, yeah, so it would have been better for that show, but, like, um, Sasha Baron Cohen is a free pass for me because something that got uh, underrated, like, I think Borat 2 probably got too much praise, but something that didn't get enough and uh, I'll always enjoy is that he interviewed O.J. Simpson as one of his characters. Unbelievable. And is like, it's very quick, but he's like talking to OJ, like, uh, don't you wish you could just get rid of her? And like makes a stabbing motion. Yeah, like he goes like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> It's what uh, Stuttering John claims to have done, but Sasha Baron Cohen actually did it. <laughs> um, yeah, so Borat 2 to me, like there's, there's jokes in there that definitely made me laugh. And again, even that scene, there's points where we're laughing, but it does take away because you're like, why are you acting like you're exposing something? You're pretending you've, you know, doxed a pedophile when, right when that's not really what happened on any on any level so um i think just too much of sasha baron cohen's politics came through in the movie and that's what made it so polarizing whereas the first one didn't have any of that like clearly right. sasha baron cohen was still a liberal at the time that wanted to make fun of george bush by the way don't forget there are a ton of george bush jokes in the first one but it didn't feel like a clear like you know psa for um uh john Kerry or whoever at the time <laughs> right <laughs> uh and this next one is the one that truly hurt my heart what's that it? dumb and dumber too this is i mean probably the clearest money grab on the list and it I made think. money <laughs> and it certainly did this is where george clooney has an argument where it's like, hey, let's just find, let's just make Dumb and Dumber two, and I think part of it is that Jim Carrey wasn't in a real silly comedy for a long time. Yep. So you you get to see maybe old Jim Carrey doing what he does, but this is what we talked about with Will Ferrell. It's like there's something about these guys when they get older. They have to change up their comedy, yeah. and only certain people have been able to do that. And it's tough to just watch Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels and be like, ah, they're still retarded. That's fun. <laughs> you know, See, like now, if you said, hey, we want to make a movie where these guys have actually matured 30 years or 25 years, whatever it was at the time. Mm -hmm. That's actually interesting to me. Where it's like Harry and Lloyd adapting to maybe they have, you know, kids or grandkids at this point or something like that could be, I guess it would be kids they, or very, maybe very young grandchildren, but probably not. Um, but that to me could be interesting. But what we certainly didn't need is the Dumb and Dumber verse <laughs> where it's multiple sequels in different directions. Um, so what, which, uh, what clip do we have first here? <clears throat> this is uh, uh, them talking about why they made it. 
Yeah, so this is similar to Ben Stiller, I think, talking about um, uh, the Zoolander remake. Is like they don't really have a good answer for this. The plane goes. Hang on a minute. He only like the music. I always have to say that to Chris Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent visuals, Chris. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, but I did. So, since you're the the last the first one came out, how many times have people approached you about doing a second one? Twenty, 20 times. Twenty times. Once yeah. a year, always on the same day. Yes. Knock at the door. <laughs> <laughs> Not you guys again. No, it was relentless, really. I mean, that's why we did the movie. It was just constant barrage of, you know, thousands of people following me ever where everywhere I went, going, I like it a lot, I like it a lot, I like it a lot. Why, why do you want to see the movie again? Because we like it a lot. Oh, so that's why you made the movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's never. I. It's never. No one wanted us to make this, but I had a brilliant idea. <laughs> I wanted them to make it. That's why when it came out, I was like, nice. But then you, you go. So the, the whole way this movie starts is Lloyd pretended to be like comatose for 20 years. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was a joke. Right. No, I understand. <laughs> but it's like, that's, that's my issue with all these sequels is it's never like, listen, we understand sequels are cheesy. So we didn't want to do one forever, but then an idea struck me. It's always People mentioned it so much that we realized we could fleece them out of their money. Right. <laughs> like that's that's the truly upsetting thing. Now, uh, the other interesting sequel tied to the Dumb and Dumber franchise is one that came out before Dumb and Dumber, Dumber Dumb and Dumber Two, which, by the way, I forgot to mention. Um, you don't need jokes in the title, I don't think. You know, so Dumb and Dumber Two is spelled T O. Mm -hmm. which that's not correct <laughs> no nope, because you're dumb you, you see the joke yeah they're fucking morons yeah they i will say though, right. yeah, there were parts of the movie i laughed at but like on the on i didn't need to see them you know <laughs> yeah, well that my thing is always why not have someone write a really good comedy and put jim carrey and jeff daniels in it right because then you're like hey i remember these guys and they were great again in a whole new thing right you know think of something for these two actors that would display what they're good at and then you kind of have the element of this is kind of a dumb and dumber sequel but not really it's almost naughty that you're enjoying it you're like <laughs> i know it's a dumb and dumber sequel but it's not yeah you were just uh alluding to dumb and dumber -er oh and yes i'm sorry yeah i <laughs> I don't know if we get shit. I actually liked that movie. Of course you did. Yeah. It's perfect for Craig. It was there was a couple there, it was funny. It was better they're, than this one. It was, <laughs> it was better than this one. Again, Eugene Levy in that movie, by the way. Well, I think it had to have been the same people. It um, just felt that way. It felt like one of the stiffler uh spin off movies watching it. Oh, oh, the same people as the American Pie, you're saying? Yeah. It did it did have that vibe a little bit. Now what was interesting is uh do you have the no exact numbers in front of you? for how much it made the, i i just assumed dumb and dumber -er when harry met lloyd i assumed that either lost money or in my memory i was like maybe it even went straight to video so uh dumb and dumber 2 with, with jim carrey and jeff daniels made 169 million dollars worldwide <laughs> yeah so pretty good we're worth doing for the studios i guess but yep in the prequel made almost 40 million against a 19 million dollar budget yeah so that's that's pretty good that's like worth doing <laughs> well i thought that i thought that's the story in that one was better there was funnier li lines it was just better to see jim carrey that's the only thing i i actually agree with you in the sense that like it that that movie probably because those characters like in real life, if they were like that anywhere past high school, mm -hmm. would be institutionalized. Right. <laughs> so it is more interesting to see them in high school, maybe. So yeah, I think the plot, you're correct. There's more of a reason for dumb and dumber er. Listen, but they go they go there's one scene where they go and they get like ices, and it's a line that just always tickles me, and I don't know why. But he's like, Yeah, they have my two favorite flavors, cherry and green. <laughs> And it makes me laugh. Boy, what a hoot. It was funny. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It was funny. That's $40 million worth of, of comedy. Hey, proof is in the pudding. Both movies were good. You're not wrong. 
that that's that's again interesting to me though because that's one where it's like jim carrey and jeff daniels aren't in it it looks bad and still you know 40 million dollars worth of people were like now what the hell i'll give it a try (laughs) you know right um but dumb and dumber 2 i think because we all knew that's the interesting thing about the the ones that come out decades later Mm -hmm. you're like oh why are you doing that much like um Again, a streaming service. So I don't know how it benefits them. But uh, Coming to America, the Eddie yep. Murphy film. You're like, why? Eddie Murphy hasn't been funny in 20 years. Why would this movie be? <laughs> um, so you're kind of like, what? why? Are they so I think it has enough of that where people are just like, ah, you know what? I want to see Jim Carrey in a comedy. I know it's going to suck, but maybe it'll give me a few laughs. It doesn't ruin Dumb and Dumber. No one thinks, oh, now Dumb and Dumber isn't funny, you know? Right. Like, you can still watch that movie. If you enjoyed it as a kid, you can watch it and have the same uh, nostalgia, I suppose. And that's kind of what I said about Caddyshack for different reasons. With Caddyshack, it's because the cast virtually isn't involved at all. Um, And with Dumb and Dumber, you know that it's just a money grab. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas the movies we're entering, the two movies we have left on our list, to me, are the examples of why you shouldn't make sequels if you're if you're an again you know for the people in them i'm sure it's a a nice payday but like why not just come up with a movie with these actors and call it something different like come up with a good idea right (laughs) instead of shoehorning a bad idea because people look at the title and go oh yeah uh and one of them these movies to me are not considered classic comedies because of what the sequels did like the original the originals are two of the greatest comedies of all time i would say probably and i don't know if i'd get a lot of argument about that unless you're someone that focuses on the sequels which it's hard to blame you because these movies did such damage to the original and the first one is meet the parents so talkers Yes, so the Meet the Parents was the original. Very funny movie, very funny, relatable present uh, 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 um, premise. And uh, I will even grant you the sequel, Meet the Fockers, while not necessary, you at least have the angle of, oh, well, now let's meet the in-laws. That's interesting, you know? And you get Dustin Hoffman and Barbara Streisand in there. That's fun. I didn't hate Meet the Fockers. It, it, it is what it is, but where it gets exhausting is like, oh, De Niro still hates Ben Stiller? Because yeah. I thought at the end of the first one, they kind of came to an understanding. He was like, wow, but you, now, do, you do care. <laughs> yeah, but not now we're going to watch another two hours of De Niro be like, hey, I got my eye on you. <laughs> and hey. that's where that's where the third one really does the most damage so i think what we're learning here today is you can get away with a sequel i don't know if you can get away with a third (laughs) no (laughs) because this is this is from the trailer of little fuckers oh right i'm so excited to see those little fuckers it's turkey time jack if you do the honors you're the turkey cover now greg thank you jack it's an honor. I'm watching you. Well, I have eyes too. So I'll be watching you. Watching me. Oh, it's everything I hate. It's like if SNL was parodying, like, hey, we're going to make a third Meet the Parents movie. Oh, speaking of SNL, Wayne's World 2, good sequel. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the best ever is probably the Austin Powers movies. That too? Yeah. Now they're all coming back to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, t- hey, it took us an hour. <laughs> uh, well, but I, I had all these in mind and then just forgot them. But yeah, uh, Mike Myers has has a few of the good ones where uh, Wayne's World and Austin Powers are, are definitely up there. Yeah, Austin Powers, all three. I think American Pie, the first three were really good. I didn't, I didn't hate the reunion, actually, because it, like you said, storyline wise made sense you can wrap your mind around yes that like that would happen first of all (laughs) yeah you know um uh wayne's world one and two are both great oh and that reminds me also can i tell you about what would have been my favorite sequel ever 
That has never happened, unfortunately. You familiar with the movie Twins? Yeah. Uh, for those of you that aren't, it stars <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito <laughs> as twins. And you might look at those two gentlemen and think, they don't look anything alike. <laughs> and you're right. That's where hilarity ensues. Uh, there was a movie that was in pre-production for years on IMDb. And it has never come to fruition. And sadly, at this point, I don't think it will, as Danny DeVito is about 80 something. Yeah. Um, but it was on IMDb and it was titled Triplets. And it starred Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito, and Sir Edward Murphy. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and I was like, fuck yes. Because <laughs> now the joke is going to be you're black. How are you, our brother? <laughs> you adopted by our mom. That's probably what it would have been. Yeah. So, so uh, that that unfortunately was never made. Uh, and the other thing that the reason that reminded me of that is um, what I saw forever on IMDb was Austin Powers four, and I was like, you guys nailed the first three. Don't do this. Don't it's, do it. <laughs> it's set up for another one. It was. They did leave it where like Scott is going to be evil now. Right. Now, what would have been great is if Colin Quinn was playing that character, as we learned in the Colin Quinn episode. But yeah, no. <laughs> that would have been awesome. Uh, yeah. By the way, I'm sure we already got angry comments. Th that's the funny thing about uh, some of the YouTube comments is people will like comment after the first ten minutes. Yeah. Like you forgot fucking Austin Powers, idiots, <laughs> or Wayne's World. <laughs> yeah. And then later they'll be like, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> sorry, I, I, you'll see underneath yeah. edit. I didn't yeah, listen to the whole thing. My yet. bad. <laughs> 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 uh but yeah mike myers probably holds the title for the best um oh and the the thing that uh made me uh, triggered this in my memory because i i've had this on the list uh as an episode idea for a while we just never got to it and then uh, what sparked in my memory was uh they're gonna make a happy gilmore too now was that real i don't know we'll see that's fingers be... crossed oh, that's gonna be <laughs> tough well the guy um is his name Joe Flaherty? The jackass guy just died the other day. Jackass. Oh, really? You suck, you jackass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's unfortunate. He was so excited he was going to get another part. I know. Disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if it's Happy Gilmore on the senior tour, I guess storyline-wise, that could make sense. Well, here's the thing, and this is kind of what, the theme of what we're talking about today. Happy Gilmore 2 could be funny. Just make it a new movie where these people are older. Mm -hmm. You don't have to include somebody's closer. You don't have to do every line you did in the first movie, write a new movie <laughs> where it's those characters years later. Like you can do that, you know? So I was going to say, has Sandler ever done a sequel, but he's done um, the one with like the, the oh, what the fuck are they called? Uh, Colin Quinn was in it. He was the, like his enemy. Grownups. Grownups. I didn't hate those two. Those weren't terrible. So yeah, grown, grown Ups 1, that that was suggested a bunch too. Grown Ups 1 is not good enough to qualify for this. Right. I think they're both okay. No. I think they're both fine. They're both whatever. Yeah. They're probably on the same level, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know what it was? It was too, the thing that took me out of the first Grown Ups <laughs> and was just the forced fake laughter I heard the entire movie. Oh, like, is that is that I, I don't remember. <laughs> Like they would, they would make like a joke at each other, and everyone would be like, ah, ha, 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 like a uh, oh, fucking okay. Ray Liotta and Goodfellas, like yeah, yeah, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, so that what got us off on this tangent is that trailer for Little Falkers is everything. It's unironically everything everyone hates about sequels. Yes, where it's like, hey, they they make. By the way, guys, Falkers, we got it. It's a funny last name. <laughs> It doesn't, that name alone doesn't warrant three films. His, na <laughs> his name's Gaylord Falker. We got it. Well, let me tell you the something. The first time, it was really funny. You know? Yep. It's an unusual name. Just going, your name is Gay Falker. Funny yeah, line. The, the 70th time, we it sounds like the F word. We understand. <laughs> and gay. So it's that. It's Ben Stiller makes a wacky mistake. Boy, after all these years, he still doesn't have it together, it seems. <laughs> and uh, and then it's De Niro and Stiller doing the same thing they did in the first, where it's like, I'm watching you. And it's all this horseshit for people to be like, hey, I, I I'm watching you guys. I remember. 
<laughs> and I think the most egregious example of what we're talking about is our last film, which to me is the worst uh, movie franchise in comedy history uh, because of what we were talking about before. I think even worse than um, the Falkers trilogy, which is so ridiculous. If you see the first one and say there's going to be a trilogy of films accompanying this. If it was much, if they like Star after, Wars or The Godfather. <laughs> yeah, if they stopped after the first, it would have been top five comedy, maybe. I mean, people will have different opinions, but top 20 for sure. Pro- Definitely, you know? yeah. But it, was, um, it was just that popular. I Like, everyone saw it when it was in theaters. I remember. It was a great, very relatable movie. And it's it's almost difficult for a plot that simplistic to be as good as it was, you know? Right. Um, now, uh, another movie like that, that came out of nowhere, by the way. Like, De Niro, at least, like, Meet the Parents, it was like, holy shit, De Niro's doing a comedy, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. The Hangover, no one knew these people. Like, you knew Ed Helms from The Office, kind of, at this point. Mm-hmm. Bradley Cooper, you've seen in stuff. Like, he was funny in Wedding Crashers, but he was not a leading man yet. And Zach Galifianakis, no one knew who the fuck he was. I did. And oh, Okay, good for you, Craig. <laughs> well, it was weird seeing him act because I had seen uh, Live at the Purple Onion. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've so seen So you him. haven't seen him in movies before. Correct. So you understood what I meant. Yeah, I just wanted to. I just wanted to plug live at the Purple Onion. And everyone yeah. should go I knew who Derek Bartha was too, technically. <laughs> <laughs> the guy from National Treasure. Yeah. But I'm not, he wasn't a phenomenon. I guess is my point. <laughs> no, I know. I know what you're saying. I was being. Um, I was being so, a smooth ass. So, so these so these characters came out of nowhere, and this was a smash hit. And Zach Galifianakis' character was like. Uh, Halloween costumes, and this is a movie that was getting quoted yeah. nonstop. This was a huge hit. Still and to this day, you will see on the back of cars the baby on board stickers. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because people couldn't rip them off after the third one. <laughs> How do I get this thing off my car? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so and the first one makes, uh, you know, relatively low-budget comedy makes 450 million dollars insane and you're like holy fuck so the studio really has no choice but to make a second one really can't blame uh, but what they did with it was so stunning to me <laughs> yeah what if we did the same the, thing but in thailand <laughs> i i shit i shit you not and this this feels almost like a memory that i've made up over time but i sw- <laughs> i swear it happened uh-huh. I was in a theater full of people. We're all excited to see The Hangover 2 because we like the first one so much. Again, I was a boy. I was naive. I was in college, I think, when the second one came out. And um, I'm in the theater, and the crowd audib- audibly sighs collectively <laughs> at this moment. It's, stu- it's, the, it's one of my favorite like um, community reactions, maybe my favorite that I've ever had in a movie theater. Because we all we held each other after this moment. We all wept gently. Exchanged numbers to like <laughs> start up help groups. <laughs> yeah, we still get together. <laughs> Rewatch this movie and cry because of this scene. What did you do to the marshmallows, Alan? Alan? What did you do? Well, isn't it obvious? I spiked them with muscle relaxers. And plus my ADHD medication. What? You brought us again! Not you. I just wanted to knock out Teddy for a little while so we could finally enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the weekend? Alan, you told me that you didn't do anything. Alan, you swore to God. I just wanted things to stay the same. And that, the, the, a theater full of people went, uh. <laughs> Because we were like, you just did the, you didn't even make that different? I know. <laughs> just make them get drugged by someone else if you have to. So anybody else. He he did it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. And like beat for beat, the entire movie is the same. Mm-hmm. Stu cheats on his fiance now with a different woman, a, a chick with a dick, I think at the time is what you called them. <laughs> um, he th- There's a, a monkey instead of a baby. And like ev- every beat is the exact 
same and then of course they realize what happened at the end and they rush back to the wedding mike tyson's in it again <laughs> you know like everything is exactly the same and then they tried to i guess switch it up a little in the third one and just no one gave a fuck about that what's interesting is again this is more of an this whole episode is more of an interesting comment on us as people right like it's hard to blame the studios because we as sheep just gather and i'm guilty of it too we all just gather to the theater to see this horse shit yeah <laughs> and it's why it's why movies like the one i love joe list's movie fourth of july it's why that's not more popular because we all are like well i want to watch captain america again is it still only on louis ck's website it's on amazon now go check it out folks fourth oh, of july yeah. i'm gonna watch that today oh yeah go get it um so uh what was i saying oh so the third one, what's interesting is it still made three hundred and fifty million dollars. Insane. Now they were just like they, they can't fuck this up again. <laughs> People are like, I dare you, Todd Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, that's a hundred million dollars less than the original and two hundred million dollars less than the sequel. So say what you want about the sequel, but um, it made over half a billion dollars. Right. Um, so, so collectively, all three movies made 1.4 billion. I think that adds up to. Yep. Um, and uh, they, you know, they made a movie that made 300 million dollars. So, <laughs> so good for them with the third one. Uh, but yeah, like when you watch interviews of them talking about it, it's like all, all you know the three stars and Todd Phillips all being like, hey, you know, it was really nice to be with the guys again and spend you know, six months with them on set or whatever it is. Yeah, that's great for you guys. Take a vacation together. <laughs> do, what do, do we care? Do, <laughs> you don't do have to show quarterly. us. <laughs> yeah. Do it quarterly or something. Don't, don't ask me to pay for your vacation with your buddies. I can't wait for the hangover four and they get drugged by like the pyramids or something. <laughs> it's just <laughs> very dumb. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, it's my favorite move. It's my favorite like moment ever. Cause I just do remember people being like, Oh, come on. <laughs> and i think that moment in the movie is after a few points where it's like the exact same beats but at least you think like how did they get drugged this time at least that has to be different mm -hmm. and if, it's like wow they really were that lazy with it huh <laughs> yeah or, or do the hangover two with a completely different cast even um i, I understand why they didn't because of the money but like that would have at least yeah. You know. That movie made those three guys huge. Mm -hmm. So to turn away from it would be kind of a stupid just business decision. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I get what you're saying, where it's like maybe it could be well, like the movie version of, you know, a show like Fargo or True Detective, where it's like different groups of people, you know? Yeah. Because the odds of this happening exactly the same to three guys over and over again is ridiculous. Three times. Uh, yeah, but you know, I like they make money, so it's our fault. The point of this episode is to say it's our fault, guys. Don't go see these sequels, you know, don't support them because they're almost exclusively horseshit, uh, except for Austin Powers and Wayne's World and American Pie. <laughs> um, so if you can think of others, leave it in the comments. If you agree with our list and our thoughts on these things, um, leave that in the comments as well, or if you disagree, let us know and um. If we have enough, we can always do another uh, bonus episode on these babies. So light up that comment section if you're watching on YouTube. If you're not watching on YouTube, go there and leave a comment or something. Because um, we appreciate that. It helps the show grow. And uh, go to blindmike.net for all of our links, wherever you get podcasts, including Patreon. Or if you want to become a YouTube member, you get bonus content and early access to these uh, episodes. Um, so, you know, like I said price of a cup of coffee every month and uh, go to blindmike.net for all of your blind mic project and why are you laughing and who are these social needs uh, or you can go to verygoodshow.org support the craigster craigers as the people call him on the streets yep um he's got rubbed out which is a true crime podcast and very good show which is just edge lords going <laughs> crazy <laughs> the tone you use <laughs> what <laughs> Edge lords, <laughs> it's guys being guys, man. Yeah, it's just you know you you you're hanging with your boys. <laughs> yeah. uh, so support the boys. We appreciate it, and uh, we will talk to you guys next time on why are you laughing. Zip it up and zip it out. Yeah.